Hi, I would like to welcome all of you to the first of three talks in the practicum speaker series this spring semester at the University of Colorado in Boulder. My name is Martha Russo and I have the honor of orchestrating the speaker series, which is made possible by a gracious donation from a CU Fine Arts alum and the support from the Art and Art History Department. And tonight's virtual visit would never have been possible without the smarts and the hard work of Kirsten Stoltz, who is the coordinator for our CU Visiting Artist and Scholar Program, and Thomas Yee, our video technician in the CU Visual Resource Center. The Practicum Speaker Series is about helping you find your way in the professional art world. Throughout the semester, our invited speakers will discuss the trajectory and evolution of their art practices and give insights into how you might consider forging your own path to a sustainable, fulfilling career and life in the arts. Tonight's guest is the extraordinary Rebecca Vaughn. I had the good fortune of meeting Rebecca in 1995 when she was an undergraduate student and I was a graduate student here at CU Boulder. What I so clearly remember about Rebecca is every time I went to her studi studio, she had something new going on. It was so clear she was an obsessive maker and deep thinker, all with a humility, vibrancy, and sense of humor that was at her core then and continues to this day. Post CU, her investigations continued in graduate school at Carnegie Mellon, where she got her MFA in 2001. Rebecca says about her work, the primary inspirational source and content of all my artwork has centered around the cultural and biological methods by which we regulate and maintain our social relationships. Exploring as direct, as intimate a relationship to audience members as I can, I create sculptural installations, conceptual performances, and evolving relational projects. I've always found Rebecca's work gives insight into feminist ideas, cultural questions, and most of all, the complex connective tissue of relationships and love. Her works are made with a wide range of luscious materials, technical prowess, color, uncanny juxtapositions, all steeped in metaphors, symbols that keep her viewers pondering, perplexed, and yearning. She's exhibited extensively in the Denver metro area, including the Denver Art Museum and the Museum of Contemporary Art Denver, and has shown nationally from LA to New York and internationally in Canada, Mexico, and China. In addition to her studio practice, Rebecca has been in many leadership roles. For 12 years at Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design in Denver, she was first the head of sculpture and then the head of fine arts. And I have to tell you, she was my boss and she was <laughs> damn good. She also served as the artistic director of Platform in Denver, a nonprofit which hosts national and international artists in residence sees who are paired with under resourced youth to create artworks which address topics of social justice and community. Rebecca currently teaches in the fibers department at the Kansas City Art Institute and the Fine Arts Department at the University of Missouri in Kansas City. That is just a glimpse into Rebecca's long list of experiences, exhibitions, and accolades. So before Rebecca gives us more insight into how she's woven her rich tapestry of art and life, here's a bit about how tonight will work. Rebecca will give us a, her presentation and then we will, we will have time for uh, questions and discussion at the end. Please type your questions in the chat and we will try to get to as many as possible. Please give the warmest mm -hmm. virtual welcome to the fabulous Rebecca Vaughn. Welcome, Rebecca. Hello, and thank you so much. I'm so honored and love hearing about uh, the wonderful program you guys have going. I confess I'm a little bit nervous because um, CU Boulder is where I started to grow up and become a real artist. So being able to speak with you guys and show you some of the inside glimpses of, of my work 
um, has me a little nervous, but I'm so excited. Um, well, I would like to share with you, I'm going to go to my, let's see, presentation. All right. Okay. Well, as Martha mentioned, I got my undergraduate degree at CU Boulder in the sculpture department. During that time, I was so lucky to have two mentors in specific. The tenacious Garrison Roots, who showed me how to keep making that gosh darn material do what I wanted it to do at all costs. The tenacity of Garrison sticks with me to this day. And my other mentor, Antoinette Tony Rosato, who shared her gentle wisdom and lured us into listening to the poetry of our work. It was Tony that said, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, then it's worth investigating further. In my whole upbringing, I had never heard anyone tell me that my discomfort should be my compass. I was always told to go towards what made me feel good, what made me feel smart and strong and skilled. And yet, it was Tony who urged me to try something awkward, attempt something that I was bad at, make something that looked ridiculous. <laughs> I grew up in a home where the idea of me being an artist wasn't really supported. But that's not because my parents didn't promote art making or a real love for art. It's just that they didn't know how to express it themselves, or more specifically, to think of its practical application in one's life. It was never really offered to me as a professional option. In later years, my father told me this one singular regret in his life was that he never followed his dream of becoming a photographer. He spent decades doing what he thought he should be doing instead, being a corporate worker, working in a bank. He died five years later, and I wonder all the time how his then fledgling photography business in those last five years could have fulfilled him more in his life. Now, to be honest, I never wanted to be an artist or an educator. I bumbled my way into both of them. So tonight, I want to show you some of the unknown paths toward this professional life I have as an educator and an artist. I was an exchange student after high school, living in the Netherlands for a year. I had planned to return to the States, get my degree in French, and immediately return to Europe to work as a translator. At CU Boulder, I took an elective course in sculpture to just try something fun and different. I loved the energy in the studios late at night. I loved the community and I loved trying out something that I was bad at. This was my final piece for my BFA show in 1994, a piece that I created for my honors thesis work. For this piece, I was fascinated by the story of Penelope the wife of Odysseus. Odysseus, who had left for 20 years to fight the Trojan War and encounter all of the challenges in the Odyssey. Well, while Odysseus was gone, Penelope was being pursued by suitors who wanted to marry her. But she was faithful to Odysseus and devised a scheme. She said that she would marry one of them upon finishing weaving a tapestry. So every day she worked on this tapestry and each night in secret, 
she unraveled all of her work. I was totally interested in all the ways that women could be obstinate and resistant. Less so about her being faithful, I didn't care so much about that. I wanted to see how I could create my own path and thus create value through destruction or obtain control through subversive acts. So the Penelope quilt, I purchased every single hand knitted and crocheted Afghan and blanket in Boulder and Denver thrift stores. I rented a warehouse in East Boulder and worked every day as if it were my job to unravel the handwork in all of these Afghans. At that time, I was really inspired by the work of Anne Hamilton, who had just been a visiting artist at CU and the durational performative acts that she would engage, like this piece called Tropos. Tropos uh, imprinted in my mind the real full embodiment of the power of installation. It's a piece in which the entire floor of the Dia space was filled with horsehair. Visitors were asked to walk on the hair and observe an attendant who would sit and burn the text from pages in a history book. The smell of burning the horse hair must have been repellent, but yet so rich and potent. This piece really set the tone for me to create the Penelope quilt, where viewers could observe me in my own destructive act and also quite unexpectedly, but happily, the smell of the warehouse in East Boulder, along with the pile of musty thrift store Afghans was a notable feature as well. Now at CU, I got a job as a gallery assistant at the then called CU Art Museum. Uh, it was a work study job. I was tallying visitor counts and helping install and deinstall shows. But um, I was able to assist artists like Andre Serrano, who at that time was very famous after his series called Piss Christ, and a curator from New York from Exit Art named Papo Colo. And I really got the bug on working in a gallery and what it would be like to assist artists. After I graduated, I moved to Denver and began working at the Robichon Gallery. So because this is a lecture about my professional path as much as my art, I have to tell the story of how I got the job at Robichon. Um, and I, I tell this to all my students because it's about that tenacious spirit. So I interviewed for a job at Robichon and I did not get the job, but I wrote the nicest thank you for rejecting me letter. Thank you for the experience and I look forward to visiting your shows, yada, yada. The nicest reject thank you for rejecting me. They were so impressed that they asked me to come and work a few hours a week. Uh, over the years, this grew into a full-time job. The experience was where I cut my teeth in a real and professional manner. I was essentially the liaison between the artists and the gallery owners and the visitors slash collectors. I did everything. I organized the inventory. I answered every phone call. I spoke to fancy collectors. I met famous people. I sold art to everyday folks. And here's one secret I have. I accidentally smeared white latex paint all over the backside of a John Buck piece. And then I cleaned it off before anyone would know. I think Jim and Jennifer don't even know this about it. 
Um, I was also the one who would call artists when something bad happened, if a piece was damaged or broken, never by myself. Uh, and it was an intense job. It was the way I got to see the utmost professional manner one could be in their art practice and how one could be the worst. I happened to be there during the time that the gallery became one of four dealers in the country for the estate of Robert Motherwell, um, a well-known abstract expressionist. And these were for the prints from his estate that were left available. This catapulted the gallery into national recognition. Now, meanwhile, I am making a ton of art. I'm just out of undergrad and living in Denver, starting to get involved in the local art community. I was a member of ILK, a co-op that was inside other co-ops like Pirate. We got a review in Art in America. And despite all of the warnings of faculty at that time about not going to grad school right away after undergrad, I was making and showing work like crazy. I was having a blast. I was producing. I was in fashion shows making sculptural garments for fashion. I really loved the space of making and showing outside of the constraints of school. This, uh, this is a series, The Cozies for the Glandular System. You could tell that I continue to be interested in making, at that time, making work with hand knitted and crocheted um, materials. These were all different glands from the body. And I love the idea that you could make something, maybe a sweet older family member would make you something to cover your, um, your um, lactation glands or your tear ducts or pituitary. Would it be possible to think that one could suppress and control their biological impulses. Um, this piece also, Cozy and Forcing, uh, this was at Ilk at Pirate as well. And I continue, as you see, this case I used found Afghans from the thrift store and I would cut them up and reassemble them. Um, I clearly was interested in continuing to address concepts of the body. These are somewhat anthropomorphized figures, tables on their laying on their backs with their legs up in the air, somewhat suggestive. The gland cozies and these cozies were like the ways that tradition could speak to making the body covered controlled and oppressed. All the while pheromones, or in this case, uh, this is the last table in this row here, are um, pa um, paper white bulbs that are blooming and filling the space with that smell that some people find floral and lovely, but other people find it to be um, caustic and somewhat referencing a sex scent. Um, so again, I was making a ton of work and guess what? I was not documenting it. So this is a big piece of advice that I tell all my students because I have so many regrets about this very active time in my art, um, path where I just have no documentation or photography of all of this work I made prior to going to grad school. Grad school, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. In grad school, I had a blast. 
it was a very progressive minded three year program where we were encouraged to try anything and everything. Earlier on today, I had the great time and honor to be chatting with Martha's uh, professional practices class. And we talked about what was some of the most challenging parts of going to grad school. At first, to me, it was really challenging to be with a group of folks I had um, never met. They weren't part of my usual circle of buddies at ILK who I could go to and I felt like we had a good rapport and we could have easy conversations about the content of art. But at grad school, which is why you go to grad school, you want to encounter people who don't know you, who don't know your background and who will give you their honest opinions. And so that adjustment at first was challenging for me, but in the end, I really ended up loving all of my colleagues, um, fellow students and the faculty at Carnegie Mellon. A, a fun thing too was that many of the grad students were working very closely with the graduate students in the Robotics Institute. And many collaborations came out of that combined critical thinking and technical computer science skill. Um, so that was really a wonderful time to watch work come out of there. But, and this was something I did not mention before, without a doubt, the most difficult thing that happened in graduate school was my father very unexpectedly died in the first week of my second year. He had an aneurysm. And because of that, he was an organ donor. I was really interested in researching the mechanics of organ donation. I was trying to process this very jarring uh, um, loss. And I came across some incredible scholarship around organ donation. And it said that some of the drugs that they give um, a recipient are histamine blockers. And what that means basically is that they make the body unable to smell the foreign new organ inside their body so that it gives their body a chance to accept and finally bring in the organ as if it were its own. Well, in the midst of all of this research, I came across this whole world of research about smell because of this cellular, cellular, cellular level sniffer for the organs. I also learned about this practice. So many of you probably know about this. It's called calf grafting, and that is a, um, a stillborn cow on the left. And essentially what it is, is a rancher will skin the hide of a stillborn cow, and they will put it onto the body of an orphan cow. The orphan wears this scent of the stillborn on its body and the mother of the stillborn will let the orphan nurse from her. So in other words, it's this amazing way to, through scent, to trick someone into being your mother. Now, this was very interesting for me because I am adopted and I have never uh, found or met my biological mother. And I thought that if this were true, if this scent, this way of using scent was so powerful that you could trick someone into being your mother, then I could find my mother 
through this project that I developed called Lure, which was for my thesis show. Uh, Lure is essentially handmade, crocheted, knitted, detailed uh, lures, I call them. And they are imbued with my pheromone. So I would capture my own smell and impregnate these lures. I would then send them to women who were approximately my age. I asked them to wear the lures hidden under their clothing, but yet emitting the smell to, and wait to see if out in the world, a woman about 20 years older than them began to act motherly towards them. And I love this idea that I left it just at that description. I did not go any further than say, look to see if they act motherly towards you. I like the idea of letting these women who I called my satellites define what it meant to be motherly. Uh, maybe it was unsolicited advice. Maybe it was someone who helped them out with a, a task or maybe it was someone who uh, lectured them. I don't know, but that was very, it would be very different for each of the women. And I love this idea that uh, motherliness can come in a myriad of forms. Uh, let's see, I have one more image. And these last few that you're looking at very specifically are made from the cut up parts of the dress that my adoptive mother put on me the day that she picked me up from the hospital. So this dress then becomes metaphorically one of the most potent objects that would hold my essence, myself, my scent, and at such a powerful time that would then go to hold my pheromone. And you could see here little bits of hair as well. And I was using many um, embroidery techniques, very detailed knitted and crocheted um, objects. So this work, Lure, is I consider to be some of my favorite work that I have made in my art career. Uh, I actually still like it to this day. And every now and then I will resurrect a lure and have a woman go out in, into the world and look for someone who might be my bio biological mother. Uh, then she's asked to report back to me. I still have not found my biological mother. And for this piece to work, I really have to hold on to this idea that this crazy crackpot scheme of sending your smell into the world could work. If it can work for these calves, it could work for us. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit because while this piece was a piece I feel very proud of to this day, there is, however, this. <sighs> Get used to disliking your own work. Now, the following series of works is are from a time when I was really starting to dislike my own work. At first, of course, I was having a lot of fun working with new materials. Uh, I was learning how to wire things up cut MDF, uh, bend uh, metal flashing on a um, box pan and break, um, cutting into found objects, modifying ladders. Um, and I was having a lot of fun getting proficient in materials. This piece called Not Exactly Love Garden was from an exhibition at Redline um, called Not Exactly Homeless. And it was an exhibition about the um, community of 
folks who live nearby and around Redline who are uh, experiencing um, experience homelessness uh, or um, hardship. So the exhibition was about this concept that one could be not exactly homeless, but be experiencing homeless. And I was asked to show this piece that was about how one could seek love, how could one seek nourishment. So what you are seeing here are about uh, 12 of those medallion shapes out of uh, MDF, cut out of MDF, and about 120 60 watt grow lights. I have to confess, right at the time, uh, Jeremiah, who was the installation uh, manager at Redline, was cursing my name because I kept blowing the breaker uh, with 120 60 watt bulbs. And the idea was that this figure on the left, which was part platform ladder and part um, crab apple lollipop tree, the idea was that could, could these medallions, could these artificial lights, could this quote unquote, love, not exactly love garden, sustain the life of this tree? Here's a little bit of a close up. And I really started to, I had a lot of fun and I felt very empowered learning how to wire things up. That was something that was always very elusive to me. And I became very um, um, skilled at how to wire up things in serial fashion uh, versus sequential. And in the end, the Love Garden was not able to provide enough sustenance for this tree. Uh, this was the piece on the last day of the show. Um, I, I was also using the ladder as a stand-in for the body. Many of the previous pieces you had seen, the hand-knitted and crocheted pieces were references to organs, the body, but I'm still interested so much in the body. Now I'm just showing it in a very rigid and mechanical way. This piece was a six foot step ladder and I drilled about a hundred some holes in all of the steps. This was in a show called Ironic Object. And very ironically, one may want to ascend the ladder, but they cannot, even though the path of the ladder is totally illuminated for them. Another ladder piece called Ham was about how one could act and present themselves as showy, sparkly, and try to get attention, try to be a ham. This is a silver lame that I had sewn ruffles and ruffles and ruffles and ruffles um, at that time. And there is like a padded kind of a shoulder pillow that sits on top of the ladder. And then this sits on as a slip cover, a cozy of sorts. Strut is a piece that I did in collaboration with an artist named Teresa Anderson. And this on the top is a ladder stabilizer. This would be the thing you would attach to the top of an extension ladder um, so that you could not, so you could stabilize and not slip one way or another. This piece, a uh, feather from Freud's pillow is an attic ladder. So on the right there, you could, if you just flipped it upside down and mounted it to the opening into an attic, that would be how you could get up into an attic. And this pink tool on the left is a part of my Aunt Nancy's prom dress. 
this is also somewhat uh, of, of a, a figure, um, a reclining figure maybe. And then this piece, Corpse Eater, this is really where I get to the point where I am talking about growing disillusioned with my work. I started to feel like I was getting gimmicky. It was, there was a ladder, there was something pink, there was something shiny, there was some kind of electric component. It just felt slick and too managed. I felt like there was no space for other people to find themselves in the work. Earlier today, uh, one of Martha's students asked the question about my use of pink. And at first I was very earnest about my choice for the color pink, that it was about um, a gendered experience, uh, that the culture has assigned a gender to that color, um, was something I was capitalizing off of. But I also wanted to call upon desire, uh, romance, things of the heart. And after a while, I felt like I was starting to get snarky. I was using it in this saccharine way. And I felt like I was getting mean and, and um, dis, disingenuous about this use of pink. And that pink then just became this uh, crutch. Pink became a bad habit. Here's another piece, medallion, which I felt like um, was about an orifice, an opening, being pink, being shiny. It just started to feel kind of predictable. And I was really getting tired of my own crap. <laughs> um, I started to think about how I could disrupt my compulsion to be slick and wrap things up with a bow. On the one hand, it felt very good to become proficient in working with some materials. I'd always wanted to be skilled and to maybe, as humbly as I could say, become a master at certain materials, feel like I knew how to make them do what I wanted them to do, like Garrison had pushed for us to do. But I also felt like it was a, a trick, a gimmick, uh, you know, something that I was relying on too much to communicate. And the piece, however, that started to get me to think about getting outside of my work, my head, in this last batch was the one called Strut. And um, I'll just quickly strut. This collaboration with Teresa was very powerful for me because Teresa had a fearlessness with materials. Teresa has always been to this day very courageous. And what you are looking at there is a tree stump that is covered with pantyhose. And then she injected that injection spray foam into the pantyhose. And it looked like this odd leg. And in combining it with the out of the box stabilizer, I was starting to feel like maybe this pursuit of finding a part, a, a material that was clumsy was my way out of my own bad habits. So I'll just fast forward here. And I worked in this series um, using, okay, so growing up, also my father, the half of the basement of our house was filled with a train, a model train set. And I'm not talking about like the train set on the floor uh, that you pull out to put around the Christmas tree. This thing was built in. It was chest height. It filled up the whole room. 
it was like a horseshoe shape in the room. You walked into it. There was like a bridge. There was an electric panel. It was serious stuff. And after my father unexpectedly passed away, my mom moved out of the house a, a couple years later. And my brother, he, we of course felt terrible about the idea of destroying the train room because it was so cool and amazing. And my brother has to this day had this um, uh, fantasy, this hope of reassembling the train room, but in some other, maybe a basement space. Um, and he cut it up into big chunks and put it in my mom's garage in her new house. And my other uh, sort of secret behavior was much to my brother's chagrin, I would go in and find some of these bits and pieces from my father's model train room. And I started to make these sculptures that were like having a conversation with my deceased father. So I was using some of the skill and the knowledge that I had previously disparaged in that last series. But that, however, in combination with these falling apart, cut up, decaying, crumbling, remnants of my father's identity became a conversation that was very powerful for me. And especially in light of losing him so suddenly and my artwork that pursues my biological family. Uh, this piece is called Quick Like a Bunny. Uh, that was what my father would say to me on uh, maybe some, some of you folks can remember, but remember the night in the week when Charlie's Angels was, was on at nine, but, my, but your bedtime was nine o'clock and you wanted to watch Charlie's Angels. So I would beg my father, could I please watch Charlie's Angels? He'd say, go quick like a bunny, go run upstairs and get your pajamas on. You can watch Charlie's Angels and then you have to go to bed. So this was a piece uh, called Quick Like a Bunny in reference to that. And this piece was a more involved version. I got a larger chunk of the train room and many of the little bits and pieces that were in the boxes from the train room. And I created my billboards of sorts this series of medallions which staked ground in my father's train room. And what would it be like for me to have a space in that historic room? I mean, this his train room had everything. Like there was a, there was a post office, there was a school, there were even like, like sassy, foxy ladies that would stand around and with their hands on their hips. It was really fun. Um, and then I would say this is, um, then becomes a, a continuance of that, this piece called History of Enchantment and the Dark Side of the Heart. Um, this you could see there are some uh, parts from the train room, but there are also parts from the house where I grew up. This um, sampler that says, let me live in a house um, by the road and be a friend to man. That was hanging in our house growing up. And I created this uh, MDF I guess you could say a, a, a silhouette or a shadow. Um, and then that was the same size as the sampler behind it. And um, also another, if you could see on the image on the left, on the top middle, I, there was this tapestry um, in my aunt's house. Um, to speak kind does not hurt the tongue. <laughs> 
Um, one of those iconic things that you see every time you go and visit family. And I, I like to show all of the guts of pieces. I know this was always a discussion with Garrison early on. If you have parts of your art that have a lot of chords and uh, um, electric components that are visible, hide them. You don't want to distract your viewers with the unsightly vision of those things. But I find conceptually for my work, I'm very interested in how those parts uh, can be an ex a way to expose all of the stuff. And you could tell I also show the screws that are holding the dowels to these pieces to keep them off the wall. And then now this is a series, um, or I should say this is also a little bit maybe the tail end of that last series. I was once um, described as a feral animal. Now that sounds really terrible as if I was being, um, uh, you know, um, it, it was um, I'm being maligned by someone. But technically she said, a feral animal is an animal that has escaped from a domestic or captive status and is living more or less as a wild animal. It was described to me that an adopted person is like a feral animal. We were once domesticated, being in the wombs of our mothers, living in our domicile with our biology. But then after being cast out, we moved to a different biological situation. We are essentially then in the wild. So I began to think of myself as a feral animal, an adopted person, someone who was both vulnerable and to be feared. This piece, Not See Me, Works Into Her, is a self-portrait. This is a seven foot long taxidermy blank. So if, um, if a hunter will, kills a, an animal, they get online and you can buy this foam sculpture called a blank. And they would stretch the hide of the bear or whatever onto the blank. This is a, a seven foot lunging bear. And I became really fascinated by this because in the same way a feral animal is both um, pitied and feared, this bear is both um, hideous, skinless, terrifying, and totally vulnerable. So I, I placed the bear out on the edge of a plank and on her back uh, are motors, little motors that are patched into a motion sensor. Also in her chest, I cut open her chest because it's foam, you can cut them open. I cut open the chest and installed marquee lights into her chest and patched those also into the motion sensor. So when a viewer comes up to the bear, it triggers the motion sensor, the lights go off as if the heart is bursting and opening up and the fans go off and the fans are blowing past um, little vials of um, the uh, scent that I pulled from the golden chalice vine. The golden chalice vine is a plant that secretes a pheromone, which when humans smell it, we can't smell it, but when we um, take it in, it makes us create the same neurotransmitters that we make when we're madly in love. 
So you come up to this bear, you trigger the lights and the smell, and you then become madly in love with this terrifying and hideous self-portrait of Rebecca, a feral animal. <laughs> um, this piece um, was a bit of a culmination of this attempt I was telling you about merging the slick kind of materials and techniques that I talk about with um, clumsy other aspects, uh, materials, uh, gross things, yucky things. Okay. Now, I said this earlier to the students as well. I think it's important to be creating work of a different scale and a material and intention at all times. Um, let me take a sip. This is a way to um, go back to what I was talking about when we need to overcome our bad habits. Uh, this, this series um, was intended for me to keep my hands busy. I was playing with scraps of other projects. I was can kind of cannibalizing other things, playing with pulled apart electronics, LED votive lights, hand carved basswood elements, found objects. And they're all about 30 inches wide by 14 inches tall, a couple inches deep. And they were all somewhat improvisational studies at playing with the materials that I just had on hand. This kind of approach is really important for me to do because I can get so conceptually heavy into my work. I can research and think way too much about the work. And what happens then is I then get into that gimmicky side and this, however, is a way to combat um, getting tired of my own crap. Uh, this actually, that uh, long piece that is um, the one singular long piece that is high up, that's an ax handle. And this piece I, is like maybe my favorite because of its simplicity a cane. And this one, you could see some of those little LED lights. <clears throat> and these are, some of these parts are just found turned legs from chairs that broke apart or architectural remnants. Okay, my my next bit of advice, and then I'm, I'm on the, um, I'm almost finished here, but you got to pay the bills. And I want to mention the whole side of uh, my art career, which is, which was spent um, teaching. And I still do to this to the present day. Teaching is to me, without a doubt, one of the most sacred acts. It has fulfilled me. And I hope and, and, um, smile so much every time I see a former student who comes to me with reports of their experience as practicing artists. Uh, I, so I taught, I ha, I'm still teaching uh, for now about 21 years. And after I left the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design, I had a fledgling business with a fellow REMCAD uh, career advisor named Susan Stites. Susan and I together collaborated to invent a school called Moxie U. And we were coming out of REMCAD and a whole bunch of us had left REMCAD. There was this whole group of fantastic um, scholars out now teaching elsewhere, and we thought we could capitalize off of that. So we started to offer classes. Martha taught a fun class called How Shit Gets Made. 
Bruce Price taught a class called The School of Bruce. And this was a snippet from Teresa Anderson's experimental unconventional drawing class where everyone had to be covered. So we were, we started this business called Moxie You. And what we found was that we were up against other non-traditional, non-accredited art schools. And they were subsidized because they were nonprofits. We were not. It became very difficult. In the end, I got an offer to become the program director for the Art Students League of Denver, which is an amazing uh, decades old art school where you don't have to get a degree and you can just self-designate your skill level, show up, learn painting, drawing, all sorts of things. I worked at Art Students League for about um, two, three years. And at that time, the marketing director left, who, who I was working with at the Art Students League, she left to become the executive director of another arts-based nonprofit in Denver called Platform. She asked me to come and work with her at Platform. And I have to say, Platform was one of the most incredible experiences of my life. Martha mentioned this a little bit when she introduced me, and that was that I was the creative director, artistic director, and I was able to work with artists, pair them up with high school youth, and together they made artwork around social change and civic engagement. Uh, this, this image you're seeing here is one of the highlight exhibitions of my time at Platforum when our visiting artist, uh, she was a writer and she coached some of the high school students to interview um, the people who are experiencing homelessness in the neighborhood. And they decided to call the show Dear Mayor Hancock, What Are You Gonna Do? Which of course made us um, fall out of our chairs because we get money from the city of Denver to support Platforum. And in the end, it was an incredible experience. The mayor showed up and had a conversation with the high school students about strategies to help the people who live in our neighborhood in Platforum. Uh, without a doubt, one of the most rewarding returns to why I make art in the first place. I felt like I got the rubber back on the road. I was making art because I wanted to make change, and this was how it was happening. So about two years ago, I made a huge life change. Working in nonprofits is exhausting. I was burnt out and so I left Denver. I moved to Kansas City where I am now an adjunct instructor and it's not, it's just contract work. I shouldn't say just contract work, it's contract work. So I don't have a reliable salary. I don't have all the benefits and bells and whistles, but I'm so happy because I get to teach. I get to have more time in the studio. I'm making art. I'm, I'm really, I feel like I'm really back in my element. And these are just some images from the fiber students at the Kansas City Art Institute. Um, you could tell a time before the pandemic hit. Okay, last, now I'm gonna finish up and tell you about the artwork that I'm making now. Ever since I made this big move. So the, the Foundling Museum is a museum in London, which is um, where the Foundling Hospital used to be. A Foundling is a person who has been relinquished by their parents. They're not an orphan. They have been maybe abandoned or relinquished due to hardship for whatever reason, and they have been brought to the foundling hospital. 
In present day, it is the Foundling Museum and the Foundling Museum is sitting on this heartbreaking archive of thousands of uh, intake paperwork that is references each child that was brought to the Foundling Hospital. So what you are looking at here are images of um, the intake paperwork when a person relinquished a child. But what is pretty incredible is that they asked the person who left the child to leave what they call a textile token. This piece of textile is a matching piece to a piece that the person who relinquished the child will keep for their self. This matching piece of fabric is intended to be the sole identifying material that the person could come back and claim the child years later. It's not DNA, nothing like that. All you could have is this matching sleeve with these, uh, the red fabric and the little flowers. And you say, this is this is how I prove that this child is mine or I can claim this child. And I've been so touched by the idea that this easily lost, damaged, destroyed object would be the sole manner that you could connect up with your biological family. And again, I return to this work around connecting to my biological family. So since then, I have started to work on a series of paintings and I'm painting. This is the wildest thing I've never in my whole life painted. Painting is so uncomfortable for me. Thank you, Tony. And I am reproducing textile tokens on maps. So as a way to get the word out, like the lures, like my satellites who I asked to get my scent out into the world. Um, could you get this textile pattern out into the world so maybe we could find the biological match? So I have just been going gangbusters and I'm almost done here. Whoops, I went through that one. And here's some close-ups. And I, I basically, I lay out a grid and then I start to fill it up slowly. And it's very repetitive. I, I love doing it. Okay, last bit of advice. Apply to everything all the time. And get over yourself when you get rejected for everything all the time. Ever since shifting gears in my life, I have rededicated myself to applying constantly to residencies, grants, fellowships, and exhibitions. I've been rejected from pretty much everything I've applied to, but I feel so strongly about my work that I keep going. And finally, I wanted to share with you uh, another step that I was doing with these textiles. Uh, you could maybe recognize that this is one of the textile uh, reproductions I made. I turned it into a repeat pattern. I sent it to Spoonflower to be printed onto three yards of fabric. I sewed it into this stop sign cozy slip cover. Uh, so this is quilted. And you can see this is the backside where I would slip it over an existing stop sign and Velcro it on. Here's some detailed shots of my stitch work. And then here is, uh, I'm driving all over St. Joseph um, to do this series and look for stop signs. Um, it's, it's pretty, it was pretty fun. It was wild. I was looking for stop signs that were not too tall that I could reach on a ladder. 
some stop signs, like this one on the left in front of the synagogue, there's like this little thing on top of the stop sign, which would prevent me from pulling it down. Uh, some stop signs like these were also on grassy patches. And I had this really embarrassing moment where I put the ladder up and I was trying to slip it over the stop sign and the ladder like collapsed under me while a car drove up. It was totally embarrassing. And what would it look like to put that message out on stop signs all over town? Now, don't worry. I just slipped them on to take a photo and then I whipped it off. So it's not like I was covering stop signs and creating accidents from happening. But finally, in, I return to the wise words of Antoinette Rosato. Whatever makes us feel uncomfortable is worth investigating further. I hope to constantly create works that bear myself, share my most vulnerable feelings about my body, my status in my family, and my role in our communities. I seek to create work which resonates on a deeply personal level, but also about the uncomfortable aspects moving outward past me to our town, our community, maybe our nation's borders our policies. Let's be sure to keep investigating the resonance that exists with each other, the unloved, those that are too repulsive to love, unfound biological mothers, unwanted children, and any others that seek to express desire or connection, but miss their mark. Thank you all so much for coming in. I went really long. I was a whole hour here. Rebecca, I have to say I could have listened to another full hour. Like you just are, <laughs> well, the weaving of the stories that are private, deeply private, and then publicly how the work comes together is, is really, really compelling to me. And it, I mean, it always has been, but what I think that, I mean, I've seen your work over the years and I, I learned so much from you tonight and the detail and the decision-making and just, you know, I'm getting, a, I got a couple texts from a bunch of different friends who said how refreshing it was to hear, you know, this very accomplished artist say, I, I've gotten rejected a bunch. I'm uncomfortable. I'm doing, <laughs> you know, all of these things to reinvigorate and and to move into the next next phase of your art making. So it was just, I really, really want to thank you for being just lovely and honest. And, you know, you're always affable and just the ability to laugh at yourself all the time, <laughs> which, um, is, Thank you. It's pretty great. You're getting comments from people. I'm Thank just going to read you a few. I don't know if you can, I think you can see them, right, Rebecca? I can, I can. So look at all these wonderful humans. Yeah, yeah. So people who, who I went to school, a, a professor, one of my art history professors is there. Great. It's great. So I sweet. I have to say um, that. I guess the, the push and pull with being elegant and beautiful and then the repugnant and the disgusting, I mean, that's one of the things I've always felt really drawn to your work about, but, but I really didn't have a sense of how much smell and scent would permeate so much of your work. And, yeah. you know, what an apt time right now, because as we, as everybody's making it through COVID and Rebecca just had an experience having COVID. Yeah. How, how has that affected you and maybe work that um, will come into being? Yeah, I think um, scent is one of those fun biological occurrences that is that whole component to art making, you know, I'm a visual artist, but I'm not just visual. Um, I'm from the school of Ruthie and Tony. Yeah. Uh, they were 
pushing us to enact all of our senses. And Anna Hamilton, and what does it feel like to have your feet on that hair and smelling things you've never smelled before? And it adds this whole component to an art experience. But then I love it too, because it, it keys into biology and the search for family. So it's, it's super personal, but it's also just like, a, it's kind of like a cool trick too. Oh, it's, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing, honestly, Rebecca. Yeah. Wow. And, and the new work with the Foundling Museum, you know, I think one of the brilliant things I've always loved about your work is I learned so much about very obscure places <laughs> in our world and culture that would not be revealed if it weren't you really putting a microscope up to these things. And then it, and then you know the poignancy about your dad's train collection, like the yeah. gamut is just incredible. <laughs> and and I know you know you are so capable and so generous that it was really great to hear that you you got burned out at Platform and you needed yeah. to you know change gears and get back to your practice. And I think that's such a great thing for everybody to hear, but especially are, you know, young students getting ready to go out in the world. Like it's one of their biggest, biggest questions is how do you keep your practice going, pay the bills, stay mm -hmm. fresh, stay true to right. your vision. I mean, right. it is a lot to juggle. And I know, I think it gives, I, I know like Rebecca's visit doesn't end with us tonight. She's going to be having one-on-one -on -one talks with the 15 students in my class. And it just, I, I think it'll give them complete courage to see someone as accomplished as you who can say, you know what, I'm going to just, I'm, I'm going to start applying to things again. And Hey, I've gotten rejected. I got to get back in the swing of those things. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to thank you for your just absolute feral honesty <laughs> and, um, and just your ability to laugh at yourself and, and really the joy of, just making and being and learning and all of those things that, that will come by. Um, the comments are just fantastic coming in here. <laughs> and I want to thank everyone for coming this evening. And um, we're looking forward to our next uh, guest, who will be Sam Harvey on March 23rd. I sh Sam is a ceramic artist and gallery owner in Aspen, and I assure you it will be another fantastic night of learning the inside story of how to forge a path in the art world. It will not be an easy act to follow, I have to say, with Miss Vaughn here, but um, Rebecca, we cannot thank you enough for sharing your insights with us. And also, I just, we're just, personally, I'm so happy that you made it through COVID. And I'm sure it's going to inspire all sorts of crazy, great things. In the <laughs> Talk about smell. I don't have any smell anymore. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, I know in this crazy time of not being able to get together in person, it really does open up a lot of doors for people I know who would never have been able to be to travel to Boulder to, you know, to share in Rebecca's really beautiful, beautiful talk tonight. So thank you, thank you everybody. And we'll see you soon.